The text this morning is Psalm 64. These are the words of God. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter, the commune of laying snares privily, and they say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. So they, sh so they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in him. And all the upright in heart shall glory. Father of the word we worship, giver of the word we read, we pray that you would be kind to us this morning and open our eyes and hearts to understand what you've revealed to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and amen. amen. The child's retort about sticks and stones being able to break their bones but words not being able to hurt them is actually entirely misguided. Words can really hurt. Words can be cruel. Words can be savage. Of all people, Christians who worship the eternal Word of God and who revere the sacred Word of God and know its power and know its authority, should, uh, should not doubt and should not disparage the possibility of words being twisted or turned or made destructive. It is not the case that words are simply sounds in the air. Words build up, words tear down. Words have authority, and when words are ungodly, they have a destructive authority. So it's not the case that words are a bunch of nothing. Words are potent. One of the things that we have to learn to do, and most Christians know and understand this, is we recognize that we have to learn how to guard our own tongues. In the first instance, that's what we should do. We should guard our own tongues. But we also need to learn how to deal with those around us, those in our lives, those with whom we have dealings, who aren't guarding theirs. How do we process that? How do we, how do we hear, listen defensively? And all of this is true also, incidentally, in the world of children. Words are weapons which children have. It, you, you know, you don't generally put them behind the wheel of a car until they're 16 because they might run into things and cause a lot of damage. But they can run into things and cause a lot of damage from the, from the time they can start talking. You can start accusing, you can start lying, you can start misrepresenting very early. And, and words are destructive at that level. Words are weapons which children have access to. And children know how to use them. They, they begin using them as soon as they can talk. Their father, Adam, taught them where the trigger is on that particular revolver. You must teach them where the safety is. You must teach them where to point it. You have to, un you have to understand that this is a world, the world of words, is a world fraught with peril. And it's very, very cute when little kids are learning to talk. But there's something else to it. There's another aspect to it. Well, let's consider what this psalm says. David usually mentions his enemies somewhere in his prayer. One of the things that is striking, um, and one of the, this is one of the things that we discovered when we first, as a congregation, went to regular, consistent singing of psalms, is that the psalmist had enemies. And his enemies show up in his songs. The enemies show up in his psalms. Many hymnals don't have any enemies at all. And in this regard, hymns are often very unpsalm like uh, There are a handful of exceptions. We're going to sing one of them this morning, St. Patrick's Breastplate. There's enemies in that one, but that's a very psalm-like hymn. Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is a very psalm-like hymn in that regard. 
Well, it's, we, we don't sing about our enemies, but, um, but this is not because our enemies have disappeared. It's not because enemies of God and enemies of his word have disappeared from the world. Rather, we have retreated into a cocoon. We need to understand that a return to psalmody and psalm-like hymns is a return to engagement. It's a return to uh, engagement with the world. It's a way of wrestling against principalities and powers. So David usually mentions enemies at some point in, in many of his psalms, but this prayer is entirely about his enemies. This, this, this psalm is all about them. This is made apparent in the first petition where he asks God to hear him and preserve his life from fear of the enemy. Verse 1, he goes right to the point, God preserve me from my enemy. He asks to be protected from the secret counsel of the wicked. The secret counsel of the wicked is hidden, and I'm asking you, God, to hide me. They're hiding their secret counsels, I'm asking you to hide me. Verse 2, these are people, the people he's up against are people who sharpen their tongues on the grindstone. Their tongues are a weapon, and they keep their weapon sharp. They keep their weapon in order. Verse 3, they dip the arrows of their words into the poison of bitterness. Also, verse 3, they take counsel in secret, and they shoot from secret places. Verse 4, their target is the righteous man. This is not an accident. They are shooting at the upright, and it's not an accident. The wicked get discouraged from time to time, believe it or not. The wicked get discouraged. It's a hard labor trying to tear down the righteous. And sometimes they get discouraged, and so they rally around one another, and they encourage one another. Keep it up. Keep it up. Take, they take care to encourage one another in their evil work. Verse 5, they look for dirt like they were on a treasure hunt. Verse 6, they are looking for dirt, and when they find it, they are overjoyed. Theirs is not a superficial malice, verse 6, but it goes deep. But vengeance belongs to the Lord, and the Lord is not absent from this equation. God himself will shoot at them, verse 7. They are shooting arrows from secret. God shoots arrows from heaven. The work of their tongues will recoil upon them. They are digging a pit for themselves, and they're going to fall into it. When this, and that's in verse 8, when this happens, men will see and declare that God was at work in this thing. Verse 9. Poetic justice is therefore the hand of God. Poetic justice is therefore the hand of God, verse 9. And so the righteous are invited to be glad in how the story ends. When the story turns around, when the ungodly fall into the pit that they dug for the righteous, the righteous are told to look at the story and read it accurately and glory in the Lord. There are dangers in that which we will consider shortly, but that's the fundamental structure of this. David has enemies. They're out to get him. David takes this, this trial, this trouble to the Lord. He pours out his trouble to the Lord. He asks God to take it up. And when God takes it up, David promises to recognize it. And he says that the righteous should recognize it when it happens. The first le lesson to learn is that slander of the righteous Slander of the righteous is not something that happens by accident. It is not an accident. It is the result of secret counsel. Verse 2, somebody got together and they cooked this thing up. The words are sharpened beforehand with malice aforethought. Verse 3, they give one another pep talks. If they start to lag in the work of tearing a righteous man down, verse 5, they lay traps beforehand, verse 5. They do what's called in politics opposition research. They do opposition research, looking for something that will stick, and oftentimes they will just scattershot it. They'll just dig up a bunch of likely things and throw it. Uh, uh, th if you throw enough mud, some of it is going to stick. Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In, he says this in Matthew 12, 34. And the psalmist here says that this malevolent abundance runs very deep in verse 6. It runs all the way down. They have a deep-seated antipathy that's directed against the righteous. So when somebody says something and, it, and the words go off like a bomb, this is not the result of a half-thought-through throwaway line. Oops, I'm sorry. 
almost always, particularly if it's, a, if it's a righteous man standing in the gap, doing something that needs to be done, contending for something that needs to be contended for, and, and this uh, pattern starts to emerge, you don't have the authority to say it's a conspiracy and name the conspirators. You don't, this is not, uh, uh, reading this text, understanding Psalm 64 is not the same thing as having the gift of telepathy. You don't know who the conspirators are. But you know, generally, as a pattern of reading the story, that there are conspirators, that this didn't come out of nowhere, that somebody is running a play. Somebody is running a play. And if you get good at reading this, you should say, you're watching the evening news, you should be telling yourself, you know, it's probably going to be a few weeks and then something's going to blow. And then it does. Well, some people, it's, uh, some people are so gullible, they're, they're, they're like the mercies of God. They, it's new every morning, you know. <laughs> every morning they wake up and say, oh, well, you know, and they take everything at face value. The psalmist does not allow us to do this. The fact that, su the, the fact that such things come from a secret place does not, know that you, does not mean that you know exactly where they came from. So remember the laws of justice, which apply to us as much as to anybody. You can't say, somebody would clearly cook this up, and therefore I magically, mysteriously know who did it, and then make a false accusation against, against someone who had nothing to do with it. You don't get to do that. But you do get to, you are invited to read the story, and you are invited to understand that this pattern is a pattern that comes from this kind of source. And you should say, I don't know who did this, but I know somebody did. I'm, this, is not, this is not a freak. This is not an accident. This is not happenstance. David understands that these people who are shooting from a secret place are shooting from a secret place because it's conveniently secret. They like to fight dirty that way. One of the things that it, it's so exasperating when you're fighting in a guerrilla war and the, the fire that's coming at you is coming from, you're not sure where it's coming from, you're not sure where the, the target is, you don't know exactly how to fight back, you know that you must fight back, but you don't know exactly how. Well, this is, how, this is where David turns to the Lord, because there are no ambushes for God. God is not surprised by anything. God has no problems. He only has plans. He sees it all laid out before him. He knows where the secret place, he knows where the conspirators are. He knows where the secret places are. He knows the number of atoms in every poisoned arrow. He made the tongue that this enemy of God is sharpening at night in order to attack the righteous. God knows the whole thing. God knows the whole story. We may be surprised, we may be astonished, but God is not surprised and astonished at all. And so the psalmist turns to God and says, God, you need to deal with this. Scripture teaches us in Romans 12, 19, that vengeance belongs to the Lord. We are not to seek personal vengeance. We are not, there's a, when someone strikes us, there's a natural fleshly thing that rises up in you that wants to hit back. That's the flesh. We are not to respond in the flesh. We are not to retaliate. Why? Because vengeance belongs to the Lord. There are times when we are called upon to respond, but responding is not the same thing as retaliating. You can, you can see it very easily when, when little children are squabbling in the nursery and somebody clocks somebody else. There's a natural fleshly reaction on the part of the person who was hit to, to just get back. I want you are mean to me. I want to be mean to you. Jesus simply prohibits that sort of thing. You know, don't, we are not to respond in the flesh. We are not to retaliate. We are not to do that sort of thing. But neither are we supposed to just stand there and do nothing. Jesus, we are taught in Scripture that we're to overcome evil with good. We are to respond. We are, we are required to respond. David responds, but he's not retaliating. All right? He's not retaliating in the flesh, but he is responding, and he's giving it to the Lord. So we are not to seek out personal vengeance, not because vengeance is wrong, but because vengeance belongs to God. There is a, go the other way. 
Just as some people in the flesh want to retaliate and just get back. I want, I want a, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I want to just go after this, this person. That's, the, that's fleshly. But there's another fleshly reaction that says, uh, the, one fleshly reaction says, vengeance is right and vengeance is mine, and it's mine because he hurt me. I'm going to hurt him. That's fleshly. But it's just as fleshly to say that vengeance is wrong, vengeance is evil, top to bottom, and God can't even do it. Those who say that vengeance is just out of bounds, and this is contrary to the nature and character of God, don't know their Bibles. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. When we appear before the great throne of God, God is going to dispense justice. He is going to, for everyone who is in Christ, he is going to extend, continue to extend and finalize his extension of mercy to us. But there is justice at the end of the world. If there is no justice at the end of the world, then this book is not the Word of God. If this, if this book is true, then God is going to settle accounts. God is going to judge the nations. God is going to execute wrath. God is going to visit vengeance. And God is going to extend mercy. That's, that's what the Bible teaches. So, there's a fleshly, let's all hug and get along, you know, universalism. Everybody gets saved. Everybody gets, it's all happy. Group hug at the end. And then I saw heaven and earth flee away. And there was, we all assembled before the throne of God for a group hug. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. So, vengeance is wrong totally. That's fleshly as well. It's a simplistic approach. So it's fully appropriate to ask the Lord to take up your case, as David is doing here. God, <laughs> you know, something's happening here, and they're coming after me, and, and I don't know who's doing it, and I'm asking you to pick it up. We see this in both the Old and New Testaments. You see it in Revelation 6, 10 with the, the saints under the altar. How long, O Lord, will you, you know, Lord, they, look what they did to us. So you have New Testament saints and Old Testament saints crying out to God to intervene on their behalf. In some instances, it is fully appropriate to take action yourself when you're not motivated by a spirit of retaliation, when you are uh, either deputized as, a, as an agent of God, as in Romans 13, 1 through 7, when you're a member of the military or a police officer, you're deputized by God, you're God's agent to do this, or you're deputized by society to defend your family and household. There, it's appropriate to do that, but it's not appropriate to do so in vicious, personal, carnal anger. When God intervenes, it's important, when God intervenes and vindicates you, it's very important that your satisfaction in this not be a, a form of ungodly gloating. We're going to consider this in a minute, that the psalm tells us that we are to glory in the fact that God intervened. There's glorying in what God did, but there's also gloating in what God did, and that gloating is prohibited. In, Psalm, in Proverbs 24, verses 17 and 18, this is a very interesting passage of Scripture. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Don't gloat. When your enemy falls, don't gloat. Why should you refrain from gloating? Because the Lord might be displeased with you and let, let up on your enemy. <laughs> you don't want him to let up on your enemy, so don't gloat. Right. And, you, and we don't. The, our modern sentimentalist age doesn't know what to do with that. We want to say, we want to say, don't gloat when your enemy falls, because surely God's surely we all have our own problems, and surely this person is just misunderstood, and and surely we can fix it. Well, you can't always fix it. This passage assumes that your enemy remains your enemy, but it's still wrong to have a gloating attitude about it. You must glory in it, Psalm 64, but, you mu but you, as the New Testament says, let him who glories glory in the Lord. So there's glorying and there's gloating. Gloating is that spirit of retaliation that has a Bible verses veneered on top of it. So if you have a spirit of carnal retaliation and you quote imprecatory psalms, you just put holy speak varnish on top of your personal, your, your personal bloodthirst, that's no good. You can't just say, thus saith the Lord, and make it all clean. When there was an incident in the Gospels where uh, a town in Samaria refused 
um, help to Jesus and his disciples when they were going to Jerusalem. And some of his disciples asked, Jesus, shall we call down fire from heaven to consume them? And Jesus said, you know not what spirit you are of. Now, in the Old Testament, there were instances where fire came down and consumed, like, you know, they, they consumed um, the enemies of God. That's, it's not that that was automatically a bad thing. But Jesus rebuked his disciples because he said, you're asking that with the wrong spirit, all right? You're asking it with the wrong spirit. You don't know what spirit you are of. So if you have someone who uh, grew up in sort of a syrupy, treacly, Christian-y place, and everything was all, you know, they go to worship and people are squirting rainbows everywhere, and it's just all clouds and sparkly unicorns and that kind of thing. And then they first encounter psalm singing. Smash their teeth. Smash the teeth of the wicked, O God. Strike them on the jaw. And especially, especially if this person just encountering it is a 19-year-old male they, of Scottish descent. He says, I, and you know, I finally found the pirate church. You know, <laughs> I've been looking for the pirate church my whole life. And and so he gets a knife in his teeth and starts wearing an eye patch, and I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing psalms. Strike the, break their bones, O oh God! Strike them down. Smite the wicked. Um, slay the blasphemer. Jesus would say, "You don't know what spirit you are of." There's a there's a carnal element to that. We just have nothing to do with it. But there, it's also sentimentalism is carnal. Personal vengeance is carnal, and sentimentalism is carnal. We are servants of God. We need to discipline our emotions, discipline our hearts, submit it all to God, and ask God to take care of it. Venge God tells us, "Vengeance is mine," saith the Lord. I will repay. Now, I've told you often, you've heard often in this church that you are to read the story you're in. Learn to read the story you're in. This means at least two things. There, I think there are many more things than this, but it means at least two things. Read the story you're in. What's the first thing? In the first place, it means being steeped, being marinated in the stories of Scripture. Read your Bibles. Read your Bibles over and over and over again. Read the stories, and don't try to read the stories as carrying cases for simplistic morals. All right, it's, it's, uh, there are morals in these stories. There's a moral point to them. But if you just t treat them as a carrying case for a, a simple moral, be good, don't be bad, or something like that, you're not, you're not going to grow in grace and wisdom. You need to read the stories because you need to learn all the different kinds of characters that there are. You have to understand that there are um, true friends. There are false friends. There are true friends who are weak who stumble and let you down. There are false enemies, you know, enemies who look like enemies but who wind up on your side. There are true enemies. There are weak enemies. There are useful idiots in the middle, as Lenin once said about this, the fellow travelers who were helping the communists do their thing. There are people who just don't have a clue. There are people who are underfoot. There are people who are in the way. And you need to read the stories, in, read the stories over and over again so you can start to see how God tells us stories. Because the story you're in is going to follow the same basic patterns and structures that the stories in the Bible follow. Tell these stories over and over again. Get them down into your bones. The serpent is crushed by the seed of the woman that he led astray. The serpent came down, led the woman astray. She stumbled her husband. And then God comes down and gives a curse to the man, cursed the ground, gave a curse to the woman, cursed um, her childbearing. God gave a curse, but also God also gave a promise. And God gave a promise to the woman and said to the woman, your seed is going to crush his head. You will have your vengeance. And the Lord of all vengeance, the one who says vengeance is mine, I will repay. He is the one who told the woman that. Eve has had her vengeance. Eve has slain the serpent because she was the mother of Mary, who is the mother of the Lord Jesus, the seed of the woman destroyed the seed of the serpent. Now, what you have there in Genesis 3.15 is God giving us one of his basic plot devices, one of, and we see it in Psalm 64, the wicked um, scheme and the wicked devise all these plots and plans, and the wicked set traps, and the wicked tell lies, and they do all these things. And it may look for a while like it's going to go their way, and then God turns it, and it, and it flips on them. 
the serpent is crushed by the seed of the woman, the woman that he led astray. She has had her vengeance. She was an instrument of the Lord's vengeance. He was crushed because he stirred up a crowd to cry, crucify him, crucify him. If the rulers of this age, Paul says, if the rulers of this age had known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What's God doing? Now, we, we understand on one level that we are, we are saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but we need to see our salvation in the story. The devil went down to the, you know, the devil said, I'm going to get him now. He's in my grasp now. I'm going to, I'm going to spring the trap now. I'm going to kill him now, and I'm going to stir up the crowd to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And they're even going to say something as deeply ironic as his blood be on us and on our children. But what does the blood do? The blood of Jesus Christ washes us clean. God's wrath was coming at this world, and Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. His blood be on us and on our children. Crucify him, crucify him. And the devil was stirring up the crowd, saying, in effect, he didn't know, but the devil was stirring up the cry, crowd to yell, kill the devil, kill the devil, destroy the devil, take him down. And God said, you have your request. And the son went to the cross and Satan was destroyed. Jesus vanquished the principalities and powers, it says in Colossians, by his death on the cross. He triumphed over them, and he triumphed over them in the very act that the people he triumphed over orchestrated. This whole thing was an, uh, God trapped the devil. Haman built a gallows for Mordecai, and he was hanged on that same Gallows. This is God's plot device. God does it this. God tells stories this way. Just as the inventor of the guillotine died by his own device. This is, this is how God tells stories in the Bible. This is how God, how God tells stories throughout church history. And this is how God is telling your story. So read the Bible stories. Read the Bible stories understanding who is doing what. In the second place, and this is harder for us sometimes. It means honoring and obeying direct instructions like this one. When the wicked cut themselves with their own tongues, when the suicide bomber blows himself up in the basement, right? When the suicide bomber needed to take a few extra lessons in his correspondence course on how to, how to make a bomb, when he, when he does that, when he, when he blows himself up with his own bomb, when he cuts himself with his own tongue, when they fall into their own pit that they dug for the righteous, when their plots all collapse. The psalmist says here that all men are supposed to declare the work of God. We are supposed to declare that God has done that. This is God's way. So we have the example of the story. We also have direct instruction on what we're to do with the story. A man reaps what he sows. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. It doesn't just say, uh, it's, this is not sort of a things that go up must come down in an impersonal universe. We can tell that. This is God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Why do men reap what they sow? Because God is personally engaged in the process. And so we are supposed to look at this, and we're supposed to declare the work of God. We are supposed to look at the story and see what's happening in it. They shall wisely consider of his doing. That's what it says here in the psalm. They shall wisely consider of his doing. God shall shoot at them. Suddenly shall they be wounded. They, their own tongues fall on themselves. And all men shall fear and declare the work of God, verse 9, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. This is God's doing, and men are required to see it. Men are required to read the story. This means that you have to be able to tell the difference between the protagonist and the antagonist. And you have to be able to tell which one you are. There are all sorts of, there's not only the pr protagonist and antagonist, and there's major characters and minor characters. There are also the differences between the sexes and human station. And then, the, then there's all the personality types, uh, four basic human personality types, Pooh, Piglet, Eeyore, and Tigger. And you have to be able to tell which one you are. Sometimes Al. Sometimes some of you are Al. 
God wants us to be able to read our stories because sometimes when we're reading in the Bible stories, when we're reading children's stories, when we're reading Narnia, when we're reading Lord of the Rings, when we're reading sacred stories, when we're reading good literature, and we're identifying with the protagonist here and, and, and uh, leaning against the antagonist and understanding, well, this is good, this is bad, we're learning how to identify. We're learning what to identify with. But at some point, you have, to start, you have to quit playing Monopoly, and you have to start playing with real money. At some, some point, you have to get out of the game. You have to grow up and go out and play with real money. And when you go out and play with real money, you're, having, you're, you're in, involved in some office politics thing, right? So a bunch of people are stirring up trouble in, on your floor, and, and trouble is coming down toward your cubicle, and you're, so you're doing this office politics thing. What do you do? Read the story. The Bible it addresses this. The Bible helps you understand these things. And when someone is plotting and, you know, politicking and trying to shimmy up that greased pole of ambition, and he lets, sets traps for other people, and the trap collapses on him, he, and he goes down, you are supposed to look at that and see God's hand in it. And you're supposed to do it accurately. Now, and, and accurately does not mean self-serving. You see, when you look out at the world, the antagonists, somebody has to be the antagonist. Somebody has to be the bad guy. Somebody is perceiving the world all wrong. Somebody's reading the story wrong. You can't just say everybody has their own story and everybody can just plug the formula and read their own story as though they are automatically the protagonist. No. There are people who really are just messed up. There are people who are getting in the way. There are people who are evil. There are people who are wrongheaded. There are people who are clueless. There are people who are faithfully standing with, the, uh, with God and with his word. And you can't just automatically say, oh, I'm me, therefore I'm good. You being, me, you being yourself does not constant, that's not reading the story. That's not understanding the story. Having read the story, you must learn how to glory in the wisdom of the storyteller, verse 10, there is sin in gloating over his endings, and there is sin in sitting there as though he is not, as, as though he is not told a story at all. If, if, you, if you look at God and you look at his story and you say, oh, well, I'm not supposed to gloat, so I'm just going to sit here like I'm bored by your movie, God. You know, I'm bored with your movie. You're not a good storyteller. No, you should glory in it. You should exult in it. You should declare the work of God. Yes, he did that. And do it without it being a fleshly desire to retaliate. A small child playing hide-and-seek will often give himself away, running out of hiding before anybody finds him, because they're, they know if somebody's coming to look for them and they find them, then they will be surprised and terrified, and so you're hunting for the, uh, the two-year-olds or the three-year-olds in hide-and-seek, and they will oftentimes just run out and, I'm here. <laughs> and the answer is because their frame at that age can't handle the suspense. They're telling a story, they're in a play-acted story, and they can't stand the suspense. It's like they're in a three-dimensional story, and they, they got the remote and said, okay, that's a fast-forward this part. I'll just, we'll just move ahead to after I'm caught, and then we'll all be, we'll be good. You've heard me say before that God loves cliffhangers. God loves cliffhangers. This means that we have to adjust our thinking so that we come to love them, too. We need to love suspense. If we don't love suspense, we were born into the wrong world. This world is full of it. This world is full of perils, dangers, toils and snares, as the hymn says. We need to adjust our thinking so that we come to love cliffhangers, so that we come to love suspense. And it's not just loving suspense when it comes to um, you're at the, th the difficult thing that you want to try to achieve or the physical danger that you're facing or the economic trial that you're facing. It's, it's also learning to love suspense if uh, up to and including people slandering you. Count it all joy, James says, when you meet various trials. It doesn't say count it all joy when you meet most trials, but this, this sort of trial you can just sort of, um, you can get depressed. On the mount of the Lord it will be provided. That became a saying in Israel because God provides the resolution at the last minute. When Abraham had the knife in the air ready to slay Isaac, God provided on the mount of the Lord, not only on the mount of the Lord, but at the very last minute on the mount of the Lord. 
So when trials are coming your way, James says it very clearly, count it all joy when you meet various trials. And we think we need a Greek word study. We, we, need, a way, we need a way out. I can't, this verse is a trial to me. <laughs> and I'm not counting it all joy. No, count it all joy when you meet various trials. This is true when it comes to physical threats. It's true when it comes to circumstantial trials. But it is also true when it comes to slander. If you want to be, Paul says, everyone who wants to, um, everyone who wants to live a faithful life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You're going to face it. It's going to happen. People are going to say false things about you, and they will not say false things about you by accident. Right? So when people are circulating stories about you at work, or people are circulating stories about you at school, or people are circulating stories about you in your family, a lot of times this is not an accident. But remember what I said about justice. Don't assume that you know every detail about it. You're just supposed to read the, the general plot line, the general story. So you're taking, one of the, you're taking a periodic slander bath, right? You need to count it all joy. There was one Puritan who said, I've learned to live in the high mountain air of public calumny. Public calumny is, he described it as a mountaintop experience. This is the high mountain air of public calumny. God will vindicate you, sure enough, but he will do it in the right chapter. God will vindicate you, but he will do it in the chapter where he has designed to do it. And when he has calculated to vindicate you, that is the best chapter to do it in. So if he's going to vindicate you in chapter 17, and you're in chapter 3 saying, okay, all done. We're, okay, this is way too exciting. You're a little toddler playing hide and seek. You keep running out and, you know, God, here I am. God says, I know, get back in your... I was, um, some of you f who follow um, blog wars and that sort of thing, I understand earlier this week there was a blog eruption involving something I'd written 13 years ago and, and somebody, it was just a big fracas and the cafeteria food fight periodically happens. I don't, just huge uproar. And I was in the middle of this uproar, and then Wednesday is my sermon prep day, and I knew that I hadn't looked ahead at it, but Psalm 64 was on the calendar, so I looked ahead at, okay, Wednesday morning I got Psalm 64 out and read it, and I thought, son of a gun, you know. <laughs> I almost became a charismatic. <laughs> Thomas Sowell once wisely said that charges of racism are like ketchup. They go on anything. And I, I've been accused of misogyny, hatred of women, racism so many times. I have been, I've lost track of them all. But Jesus says that we are to rejoice when this sort of thing happens. He, he doesn't just say it's okay or just bear it like a stoic. He doesn't say act like a stoic. He, stoic. he doesn't say stand there like a, a, like a cinder block. He says when this sort of thing happens, you should throw a party. He says, be, be joyful when this happens. He said, no, no, go beyond that. He said, you should be exceedingly glad. Exceedingly glad. Why? Because you can see the story. Now, of course, if you can't see the story, the, the exhortation to be exceedingly glad is just saying, it's like saying, go insane or go crazy. But it, it's not, God's not telling you to go insane. He's not telling you to go crazy. He's saying, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad because you know how God does this. You have to know God's pattern. You have to know God's way. You have to read the story right. But don't you just want to get in there and explain to them, run down to them, and explain to your adversaries one more time that this is not true, I tell you. I'm not, I'm not a racist. I, I don't hate women. I'm not a racist. Look, they know that. They know that, and, and the, the, one of the reasons why they say that you are a racist, they, they say that you are a hater of women, is it's so much fun to watch the reaction that they get when they do it. And you, they pull the rope, but why, why do people pull the rope? They like to hear the bell ring. Right? That, that's why they do it. And so what you ought to do is just be exceedingly glad on another way entirely, another front entirely. Why? Because we're Christians, and Jesus said that we're to live this way. Jesus said that this is the way it goes. This is the pattern. 
When Christians act like, when, when something happens, when something blows up, when Christians are accused, when evangelical Christians are accused of being all sorts of evil, vile things, many Christians act like that this is an instance of things going horribly, tragically wrong. That's not true. It's an instance, perhaps, of the first glimmering light of faithfulness in many, many years. And so people, and all of a sudden, people say, oh, no, I'm a, a protagonist is starting to develop, and we're the antagonist. Let's get together and cook something up. And then they, they throw things at us, and we go, ah! No. Make sure that the charges aren't true, incidentally, right? Make, make sure that you are not providing fodder to the enemy, but remember the fundamentally you need to read the story as the kind of person who can be exceedingly glad when Sauron doesn't think a whole lot of you. You think, well, you know, if I go to Mount Doom and throw the ring in the volcano, how's he going to feel? <laughs> He's going to feel pretty bad. But at the end there, he was positively panicked. And so they know that. They know this. They, uh, Jesus once says that the children of this age are oftentimes shrewder than the children of light. And this is an instance. They know what side they're on. They know what they're doing. We often don't know what they're doing, and we often don't know what we're doing. What we ought to do is throw a party. What we ought to do is behave in such a way as to irritate the enemies of God and not act like everything's gone terribly wrong when that happens. And when they do, when they respond and they accuse you of all sorts of things, throw a party, rejoice, and be exceedingly glad. Father, you know how hard it is for us to embrace the waiting and how little we like embracing the suspense. Give us understanding, we pray, in good spirits as we await your deliverance. As we pray to you now, please receive the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, the charge is this, cling to God's story. Cling to God's way of telling stories. You sometimes think we can just take our hands away and not cling to that, and, and surely common sense will assert itself at some point, and we can just go on. No, you have to hold fast, the Bible says. Hold fast to what God gives us. Cling to God's story. A few, a few years ago, someone actually published a book where they retold the whole story of Beowulf from the perspective of Grendel. You know, Grendel had, uh, the monster had his own hopes and dreams and aspirations, apparently. And, and, and we have to be able to step into, no, none of that. Hold the God story. Tell stories the way God tells stories and understand your place in it. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon and remain with you always. And amen.